Hi everyone, I'm Kate. And I'm Larissa. We are breaking out of Zoom, stepping out of the gallery and into the studio of some of Long Island's finest artists and craftspeople. Yeah, and while we do that, we're gonna take some special guests with us along the way. You might see some visitors on some of our artist encounters, which I'm excited about. And we'll be taking you along as well, and you can leave comments in the comment section below, and we'll be sure to answer them after. Yeah, let us know who your favorite artist is, or what your favorite part of the video was, or if you had a favorite piece that that artist created. Hey guys, don't forget, like and subscribe. Off we go. Off we go, yeah. <laughs> Today, we visit the studio of Long Island artist and printmaker, Lorena Salcido Watson. much for having us to your studio today. Uh, could you share a little bit about yourself and this beautiful space that you're working in um, and tell us a bit about your history as an artist. So um, welcome and um, this is my studio built by my husband Jamie um, and I have friends that say he must love you a lot and he <laughs> built this and yeah it was over the winter time there was actually ice up on that uh, post and they had nails put in there so the guys wouldn't slip. I couldn't watch, it was, it was intense. But Jamie designed it um, and I'm really lucky to have a space. I, before having this space, so um, I basically had no space to work. Like mm -hmm. work couldn't be next to each other. I had like maybe a foot to step back. Uh -huh. um, and so this was a revelation. Um, so I went to uh, Stony Brook for my MFA and they gave us really big studios and that changed my life. So that was really exciting because I started working larger and um, basically everything was 22 by 30 according to the size and uh, I got really ambitious and used paper on a roll. And some of the imagery that I started working with was very body related um, and I my, my background, okay, so I, I went to Cooper Union um, and I um, did a lot of painting and did some printmaking. And I remember getting a very brutal critique from one of my professors who I used to commute and I would never recommend that to anyone. I commuted from Patrick to Manhattan and I was always early and I never slept and I was always really um, stressed out. And I remember walking in front of Woolworths, there was a homeless woman and I would see her every morning. So I did a painting of her uh, from memory as my, my project. And this is the days where people would smoke in the classrooms and he would be puffing on his cigarette mm -hmm. with his dry lips saying, yeah, you know what I see here? A big waste of art supplies. And I hadn't slept. You know, when you haven't slept and you're like hearing white, I was just, I didn't know what to do with that. Wow. So yeah, it was, it was really depressing. So I took a year off of school because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Because it was competitive and snarky and everybody that was competitive getting in were still competitive being colleagues. So I took a year off to go paint in Guatemala. My parents mm -hmm. took a trip. And then I thought, I love this, but I want to be an ethnographer. I need to document my, 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 my indigenous history. So then I came back saying, I've got a mission. I'm gonna go back to Cooper, I'm gonna finish up. And then I only did prints and the, nobody was ever in the Litho studio because it's a lot of work. And then I thought, <laughs> this is where I wanna be, far away from painting, no thank you, no thank you. And, and I made lots of prints and it was hard and grueling. And I made a lot of Litho, so that first year, I, I went and I applied to grad school and I didn't realize I got a letter of recommendation from Dory Ashton, who's like a bigger big shot than I realized. Um, she was my, my teacher. Uh, and I went to SUNY Albany to study Mesoamerican um, culture and hieroglyphics and everything that I was obsessed with because I thought, I'm a Mayan and in my sleep, I'm gonna be able to learn Mayan dialect. 
I just need to find the tapes. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I went to Albany, and because they have a really great Mesoamerican uh, department, and I was so depressed, and it was cold, and I fell down like every day on the ice, and I thought this is hateful, and I was so depressed, and then I thought, you know what, I'm going to cut my losses, and this is not for me. This is applied reading, not not for me. And then I came back and found them the pavement and found a job. I got my portfolio ready for illustration. I got my portfolio ready for printmaking. I got my portfolio ready for drawing. And had no idea, had no 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 solid feeling that I was going to um, work in art. Um, but I had had a printmaking internship um, while I was at Cooper, and there was no internet back then, back in the olden days. And so you literally had to find your own opportunities. And I realized that I had actually um, studied with somebody who was a professional printmaker, and they never revealed that. And nobody lifted a finger to make any connections for you or to help you. So I thought, hmm, that's a bummer. I think about that now. That was really kind of a bummer. So I, I find it's really important to try to, to try to be there for people because how hard is it to make a phone call? How hard is it to call a friend that you know someone? How hard is that? So that's that's kind of important to me just from from that experience. Um, but my first job, I actually walked into a, a printmaking studio with my gigantor portfolio wearing pumps. <laughs> it was disgusting. <laughs> and then I, I opened up my, my portfolio and she was a one woman operation. She had a gallery in the front and a printmaking studio in the back. And she was so happy to have me and she trusted me with everything. And I became her studio. And I mixed the ink. I collaborated with the artists. We did mono prints and we did etchings and I went to visit artist studios with her. I did all the photography for the place. Um, I did all the pricing and I felt like I can do this. And I, I think I think that trust made me grow so much. Um, so I was with her for a bunch of years and her goal was for me to be able to afford an apartment in Manhattan. And um, she, she was, she was a nice lady, um, but she was awesome and she trusted me. So then 1989, the stock market dipped and she said, I don't, I can't afford to keep you. What do I do? What do I do? And I said, make a phone call. And I had seen, um, Jasper John zero through nine when I was in college and it was his lithos. Um, and I thought I could do that. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what I, what I mean by that, like if I could draw that or I could print that, but I remember writing the name of the workshop, ULE, um, on my sketchbook, and I thought, I don't know, I'm going to keep that in mind. So then I said, make a phone call, call them, tell them I need a job. <laughs> so she did. And then she called them, and, and um, I had a, she called on Thursday, I had an interview on Saturday, and I was working on Monday. <laughs> And it was really cool and it was intense because, yeah, the interview, I always tell my students, it's like looking at, looking at my work and she insisted that I get a printer seal. She's like, this is you, you, your, your input has to have its mark there. So I, I got my, my uh, printing chop before I got married, so but I, I kept it. Um, and she would make sure that she, we had the publisher seal and then my seal on it so that that was really clear that my talent was part of that, which is a part of the Japanese printmaking tradition that every artisan has their mark in there because their full career went in there and that acknowledgement is important. Um, but then I went in and that you were like, mm -mm. and I was like, oh no, 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 of course not, of course not. So, you know, I, I, of course not. And I remember commuting and they have a sit down lunch at ULE. And for the first lunch I went in and everybody's sitting around the table and I was the only girl. Like, oh. So one of the guys stood up, John Lund, he's Jasper John's primary printmaker now. And he said, you know, you're among the gods of printmaking now. And I, was like, I know, I know. And we would have a sit down lunch every day. Everybody would come from their workshop and have lunch with the artist or the collector. And, you know, it was started by Tanya Grossman, um, a Russian emigre, and she was very classy. And there was, you know, there was wine, and seven course meals, and everybody got really relaxed, and it was nice. <laughs> and, and you had an opportunity to, like, relax, because then when you were working, you're working, and you're focused, and you're serious. Um, so that was my, I guess in a way, that was my dream, my dream job. And I learned a lot, and I, I had some great colleagues. Um, 
I was invited to give a talk at Cooper Union about working in a professional workshop. So then I went back to Cooper and they were just redoing their print department because they had been working with nitric and zinc and the nitric acid had basically etched away the entire vent system. So they broke the walls and there was nothing there. So they decided that they needed to switch to something else. So we switched to um, uh, ferric acid, which is a salt, no fumes. Um, and they had been just doing dry point and engraving until then. And so I was the first teacher that went in there to teach printmaking and it was amazing. And I love teaching and I went back to work and I told my boss, I was invited to teach, what do you think? You know, can, can I do this? Can I take one day off and, and teach? You know, obviously no pay. And he's like, well, you know, you're not going to get the best projects. And I thought, okay. And, and it was really important. And I had um, a nephew who had passed away um, shortly before then. And he was 20 and he was an artist. And all of the kids that I interacted with, mine were younger, were like him to me. And I kept thinking that if he had somebody that believed in him, a mentor, you know, hindsight's 2020, but I thought if he, he might have gotten over this really tough part in his life and he'd still be here. Um, so I saw Luke in, in all of my students and then my kids grew, and then my then I saw my kids and my students, and and I just thought I need to be here. I you know part of me in in, in my sadness I needed I needed to be that for some kids, and and I loved it. And um, yeah, when I was at, at ULE, I you know working on these fantastic projects, and you um, you put one hundred percent of yourself in there. So your art stopped happening. My art stopped happening, and I had um, four kids in the process. <laughs> we all, everybody there kind of grew up together, and um, there's pictures of me with my, my mask, my giant belly, and I wore a respirator because I thought my kids were not going to be too bright if I don't do something about this. And this is before people wore gloves, you know, wore a lot of protective gloves. We had one shop that had ventilation, and it was, it was something that you had to decide, I need to take care of myself. So I, I basically suited up when, when I was pregnant. And um, yeah, it's funny. There was like no no maternity policy because it was only guys. And when I interviewed, they asked me how how tall I was and how much I weighed just to make sure I could you know be one of the guys. And I was I was one of the guys. <laughs> and and um, I I worked hard and worked on some amazing projects. You know so and yeah. But when when we worked with Jasper, I got to mix color and and it was really it was really great. Like knowing that you're doing you're doing it right and and. I've got to printmaking. <laughs> so, and it was actually fun to work with people that didn't know printmaking because they didn't know a sense, they had no sense of limitation. Um, so part of uh, what you were doing was inventing things. So I worked on a lot of projects that were a little bit on the wacky side because we weren't allowed to say no. <laughs> we weren't allowed to say we can't do that, you can't do that. We were just gonna say, let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Who is your favorite artist to work with at ULA? Elizabeth Murray. Why? So the weird thing was I was paired with all the women because I was a girl. And so I, I, Kiki Smith was somebody that was uh, recently um, invited and you can only come to make prints with us by invitation. Mm -hmm. um, so Kiki had work in a Brooklyn Museum show and she came and I think she did most her really important work was maybe her first couple of projects and she did this one piece, Banshee Pearls, and it was all very experimental, very autobiographical, many layers. Um, and Elizabeth Murray was somebody that, she was really, really special to me. Um, I started working on her etchings, I didn't get a chance to meet her till later, and we were collaborating on, on lithos. There's a lot of uh, people in the workshop doing uh, etching, and most, about two, three of us that did lithography. And so they paired me with her, and I think part of, you know, just like the ease of, of, of communication, um, and she had three kids, and I had three and then four at the time. And so, you know, it, she, Time herself to um, you know come in and work around childcare, and we she worked on three dimensional pieces in her paintings as well as her prints, 
And so she would come in and she was super energetic, super, she knew exactly what she was doing. And after working with her, I would, I would get really juiced up, like, I need to make some work. And by then I had stopped making work. I had my sketchbook, but I'm busy being a mom, busy working like crazy and, and learning to be a parent. Mm -hmm. It was just a lot. Um, but then I, I, I thought, I really feel like I need to work because she makes it look so fluid and, and I can do this. I know I can do this. So I'd go home and sketch a little bit and then get back to work and then proof like crazy the next day and then the next and the next and the next. And then we worked on a whole bunch of images and um, we just had like real conversations and about, about being a parent, about what it means to have a teenager, what they're doing. Oh no, did you know that this is kind of what's being done? And I was like, no. <laughs> It was it was it was really special. So sometimes I'd go to her studio and bring plates and lay them out for her if she didn't have time or we'd meet in a workshop in Manhattan on Watt Street and we had a lot of private time to just have good conversations. And I remember working on this one one project and I asked her, like, when did you decide to commit to your art? Because, you know, she taught and she really became hardcore, I think in the forties. And she said, you just have to say, it's time. I need a babysitter. It's time for me. And that was something that I never thought of. <laughs> like, I honestly never, never thought of that. Um, so I, I walked around with that. And every time I would do test plates for her, I wouldn't do just like value scales. I would do an image. I'm like, it's, my, it's information for me. So I'm going to try. And I started doing my own, my own work. And then I started doing my own work during lunchtime. And then I started building a portfolio. And when I started teaching, I needed to develop images as examples because I had no examples. So it was really kind of funny to go and present your work. And, you know, you have all these Cooper students that are like the best of the best. And they're like, hmm, what does your work look like? And I, I had to like lose my ego because I thought this is about showing you something, you know. And, and it, it forced me to make work because I needed it as a teaching tool. So I still do that. I mean, I still... I, so maybe too much, you know, a lot of what I do, a lot of time goes into making teaching tools. Um, I often have to make a choice. Do I have a family? Or am I going to go for the career? And I have always wanted kids. I always wanted a family and that was not negotiable. So I, I'm greedy and I want everything. And, and so I was working toward that and Elizabeth gave me the key. So that's what I did. I got babysitting. Duh. <laughs> got paid in the city and then I started doing that and then I went back to school so I could teach and then that big studio at Stony Brook brought me to making my work um, okay, so I had bed rest and she was a breach she couldn't turn because I didn't no gravity so this kid was upside down and they said okay we're gonna need an x-ray so they took me in for an x-ray and I was gigantic and I took pictures like right before I went into delivery just to see how bizarrely gigantic you can get and then this x-ray of this little fetus, this little fully developed little insect-like creature inside my pelvis. And I was like, oh my God, this is like the best picture ever. And then I said, I'm gonna need a copy of that x-ray. So then I made a contact print of it and I kept it thinking, I'm gonna work on this sometime. I'm gonna work on this. And then, so my, my x-ray stayed in my drawer and, and, and the contact print. So some of the first pieces that I started making at Stony Brook were about about the process of being used, being a, a vehicle. And at that point, my oldest daughter was in 11th grade and she decided she wanted to go to private school and she got a full scholarship to Phillips Exeter and then got there and said, I hate it. I don't know these people. They're like, not my kind of people. And she cried and it was such a sad time it was like, I cried. She was so, so devastatingly sad. It was a couple of months that she was there and we thought, this isn't good for you. But that whole time I was thinking of, of how once you have a child, you're not you anymore. You know, the whole chemical process of, of that, that whole transformation. And, and yeah, so I started doing these images and I drew my chicken. I drew the, my chicken pelvis. And then I thought, this could be chicken. And I did an image of myself, almost like eviscerated, like my spinal column, my pelvis. And it was just like I was flayed or splayed. Mm -hmm. And I put together pieces of paper because I needed more space. And 
it just, they just kept growing. So then they ended up giving me a larger studio at, at Stony Brook because I was like filling up my walls, which was really nice. And then I got a, a larger studio and then I found paper on a roll. So I didn't have to keep lapping my, my pages together. And I thought, this is the kind of thing that you need to know that this experience just like blows your mind like nothing else. It's larger than life. So therefore my pelvis needed to be walk-in size. You needed to be able to like get inside there. So some of, some of my early pieces are very, very pelvis and I then had child number three and I was had herniated disc. Mm. And I remember sitting at a concert just thinking, what does that look like? What does this pain look like? And I, and I just like felt the radiating pain in my sacrum. And I, I, I sketched it on a program and I thought I have to draw that. And then I would do that. I was like, I have to remember this. I have to remember this. And a lot of times it's just like the, the physical sensations are what I wanted to talk about. And if you, if, if you lived it, you would know what I'm talking about. So the part of a lot of my work is really, I want you to know that I'm with you because we, we did this together and it was very bizarre. So I'm at Stony Brook and it's a university and, and the gallery where we exhibited had medical students who was right at the, the library. So people were coming and going and, and, and looking at your work. And I remember I did a series, my first solo show there. And one of these were people studying, uh, students studying to be um, x-ray technicians. And they're like, what view is that? Like, <laughs> what part of the body is that? And I had actually like merged the thorax of an insect with a human pelvis. And it was like, I don't know, what do you think it is? <laughs> because it was, it was the kind of thing, it was like, formally, there were these connections, and I'm like, I can make some up, because they feel so common. So it's like when we look at the underside of our, our moth, or, or, or the interior of our, our spine, or the, that of a chicken. Um, so I started going back and forth, and it was really kind of abstract, and then I started having body issues. So then I was very literal, you know, like nerve, um, issues. So a lot of my work really it sounds really pathetic. I'm in pain when this when I'm drawing, and it, it's like more vivid because I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the electricity. I'm feeling the weight of my tailbone. It's, it's connecting you to a part of the body and the human experience that you don't normally connect with, and it kind of brings to light those parts that are kind of always there but never right, right. And and the fact that right now it's like we have access to so much imaging and we can keep it we can look at it you have your mris it's like you don't always know what you're looking at but so i've got my my anatomy books and i'm like okay what was that term again and then you look it up and like when i had knee surgery i'm like oh my god that is so complicated how do they even do that it's just like so many tendons winding and and it's just like it's, it's a puzzle with tension they're gonna do that they're gonna cut in there and and so then of course i have to look and like everything from everything from getting a root canal. Can I see, have, can I see the nerve? I want to know what it looks like. I, I, it's like, I want to know, even if it's horrific, just so that I know. So when I had my C-sections, I said, Jamie, take a picture. <laughs> take a picture. And he's like, no, no. Cause they put the tent, yeah. yeah. but little do they know, duh, the light, it's right there. I saw it all. <laughs> so then one of the anesthesiologist assistants took some pictures. I'm like, how many times do you get a chance to see what you look like? So yeah, I needed yeah, to know. I put them in the photo album and they walked out. I, I, my kids don't always love my ideas. <laughs> I know that they're there. <laughs> they don't always. So was, was, your, was your passion and desire to do or create artwork around the human body and form because you were pregnant? Was that developed because you were pregnant? or it, it... I think I was always obsessed. Okay. But I think being pregnant, it was just so abstract. You're on your own. They don't call it labor for nothing. Um, but like when that body show came out, I was like, oh my God, I'm all over it. Yeah. And it was, it was, it, it made it, part of it, it was intense. It's like they showed you what does Parkinson's look like, you mm -hmm. know, and, and what does lung cancer look like? Have you seen it? I watched the first episode. It's like a black sponge. Mm -hmm. And it's like you, you, you wake up. That, it, it was intense. That show was a little bit, yeah. But, that that was important. It's like you need to know. I don't know. I'm always really curious. I I need to see everything, and I need to collect everything. And and yeah, I I think part of part of all all organisms. It's like formally, we share a lot. Um, and I think I think curiosity is something that that makes it so much fun to also like work with kids, um, because that's pure. Um, but yeah, living. 
like your imagery trans transition from this this medical imagery to botanical. I think it was always it was happening. always there. It was always happening. So so my hydrangea skeleton that was it. It's like so my in my garden I've got my hydrangea. Oh yeah, this one over there too. Yeah. So I started I started my garden looks horrific over the and that's the beetle from Princeton was it? <laughs> my my garden looks pretty horrific over the winter, but basically letting the the fleshiness fall away from the flower petals reveal skeletons. And again, it's like formally and, and, and talking to kids and saying, it's like, what what do you think about? It's like, you know, what, what holds us together? What gives us form? So going from botanical skeletons to exoskeletons mm -hmm. to human skeletons. And so that one, I actually wanted to give that sense of boniness, even though um, it started off being black and white. And with the drawing, I wanted to go back and forth Imagery really goes from like everything that I collect and document and getting to know it. And then the imagery finds its way into my work. Um, yeah, so the pieces on the wall. Okay, so I did a lot of eyes. Why are the eyes? My kids like, mm -hmm. you got an eyes there. So when the kids were little, Camille, my oldest, is in Home Depot with Paulina and they're fighting over a caulking tube and pretending it's a baby bottle with a doll and the caulking tube goes plunging into her eye, into the sclera. And I remember getting a phone call from my husband, Jamie, at work, and I was working with Kiki, and he was, he was, he was crying. He, he, was, he was totally freaking out. And he said, there's been an accident. You know, her eye pulled in. So I started drawing lots of eyes and looking closely. At, you know, basically it was magical. Um, then my kids did a dissection of a sheep's eye. And they said, parents, any, any, any volunteers to handle the scalpel? And I was like, yes. And it was like a little sad washer. And I was like, no, the magic is in life. It's not in, in the form or the object or the substance. It's in the life within that and that, that hydration. Um, and then I kept thinking about eyes. And then Emily, when she was three, is opening up birthday gifts one morning, goes, gets a paper cut across her cornea. And she just covered her eye and she cried, cried. We didn't know what was going on. And that's like the only part of your eye that, that feels pain. And it healed quickly, but I could not stop thinking of eyes. So I, I did a lot of eyes, just looking closely, seeing if there was any scarring, you know, both Camille and Emily, and, you know, hoping that their vision would be fine when they were older. I mean, they're, they're fine. But that was terrifying. So then my kids would be like, I'd be drawing enough eyes. I'm like, no, I, I, I'm not even sure I've got it where I want it. So, yeah, I, there's, there's more eyes in me. There's a, a beautiful, like, fragility to both the eyes and your other forms. Is that something that you take into consideration? And just, like, the general, like, fragility of the human form and, and everything that... Yeah, yeah, that, that whole malleability, the fact that in, in, in a woman something so complex can be destroyed, damaged. It yeah. seems like that's something that it really could impact a viewer with as well, that they don't have to go through those experiences that you've no. gone through <laughs> to really appreciate that and that you've come to know through different events. I hope so. I hope so. That's, that, that, that's what I want. I, I want somebody to make a connection. Not to, it doesn't have to be my connection. I, I, I try not to talk too much. Like when you have artist statements or, or work statements a lot of times it's like I'm, I'm like feel something or don't you know but I want I want you to like reach into your own experience to find a connection if you if you do find one and chances are you've come across a lot of what I collect or I've looked at or I've lived and and some of those connections could be made and maybe you don't live with them so that's a tricky thing my and people have told me you know your work's not my cup of tea but that's that's okay and in this part of it, it's like a lot of it is you have to make it you just have to make it. So some of the some of the work that I've been working on. Um, so I lost my mom in 2014, and then I lost my dad. And with my mom, I lost her like two days after having shoulder surgery. And I remember it was like the saddest thing ever. My mom was my mom, and I couldn't even raise my arm. I couldn't feed myself, and I learned how to draw with my left hand. And I had my little stumps of my charcoal pencils and I thought, okay, this is in, it's in your brain and you just have to find the right way of holding it just so that those gestures could be made. 
And part of what my morning was about was drawing my bones, having a finite image. And I would draw with charcoal because it was blunt and fast and it would have a beginning, a middle and an end. And I would just have a job. Um, my job was to get to know this. I just like to spend my day crying over my drawings day after day after day and with my left hand and just feeling helpless. And I did drawings of main rocks, like separating with my spine kind of falling in, mm. in between. And then I did lots of bones and not necessarily to show, mostly to learn, but mostly to like process, what does it feel like to be ripped open? Like, what does it feel like to, to not say anything to them ever again? And um, I didn't get to say goodbye to her. So it's, it's the kind of thing where you need to process it. So I realized that with the death of both of my parents, I needed to get into my own space to uh, let, like, put it out there. And some things are horrific and that I never need to show. And that's okay. But they won't stay inside me. And yeah, and I, I did drawings of how I was feeling with my dad. And it wasn't, you know, my ego, poor, poor me, but it was more like, I feel like an organism that is out of control and it helped a lot. So I think part of the imagery that was worked on during the pandemic was really a little bit of that. Like, what are we, what am I feeling? Um, and so I, I started working on, um, we had a faculty show, so I, I created work for it. And then I, I worked on, on um, that piece, what it feels like to be in limbo to be, you know, kind of a, a fragile, protected structure. Everybody was on lockdown in their homes and not really having ideas of, of what was safe and what wasn't safe. Um, and it was a familiar form. So for me, that was, you know, uh, metaphorically uh, representing our kids trapped inside, you know, not being protected and, and basically living out. So the skeletized, um, it's a tomatillo, um, basically, uh, that's, you've got all these seeds waiting, you know, those are, those are the seeds and they're just waiting. And I wanted to create that, that strange aura to, to give a feeling of that surreal, like, um, solarized quality. And that other piece that I was working on was right when I lost my dad. And I just felt again, like ripped open and, it, and that with the pandemic felt existential. So I thought I was working on drawing ammonites and whirlpools and just like feeling pulled from every direction. And I think my sternum, if I were an insect, that's my thorax. And I have images where I have wings and I think it's all me, you know, the, the, the whole sense of I, I can fly and sometimes I can't because of my shoulder and sometimes I can do this but sometimes I can't. And I, and I think I take the representation of some of my insects and, and then the body. And sometimes I become translucent and see through and just become kind of cosmic. Like it becomes more about space. Um, so that's where those two pieces were right um, during the pandemic. That's the question. What? Medium, are you using for these? And I'm going to use those. Oh, for charcoal. Is this charcoal and oh, okay. what else are you include, okay. including in these two pieces here? Okay. Um, so, this, I love working on um, black. I love heavy contrast. And the funny thing is, once when I was at Stony Brook, I was doing uh, lithography and I started working on these drawings. I started, I, I was working on a drawing and I blackened it out with ink, in the ink. So that's what I did. I, I use um, printmaking paper that has sizing and I put India ink over it and I started erasing with those pumice pen erasers. And I'm thinking, I'm doing a mezzotin on a drawing and like really basically testing the paper to see how much it'll put up with. So a lot of my drawings on in charcoal um, go back and forth with a lot of erasing and some of the drawings are starting to cry and the paper is getting all peely like saying enough, enough. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll beat it to death. Different batches of paper will have different amounts of sizing, which is kind of sometimes a, not a fun surprise. Um, so this one I decided I wanted to work over it uh, with colored pencil and 
I love working with silver uh, colored pencil over black because it's, it's, there's something richer um, than working with white. And I wanted the Monarch to have, you know, just like the, the variations in the tone. So I ordered some copper toned and gold toned pencils to try to see if I could sort of model out a little bit of the variation in, in the tone. So with this, I'm erasing and going back and forth. And I thought this black isn't black enough. So I'm gonna come back in here with charcoal to like really make it feel like these are cutouts. Sort of like that whole, like, is it a hole or is it a tone? You know, is it space or is it is it color? Um, so this is gonna hopefully get really poppy. So it was a white sheet of paper that you yeah. completely covered in ink? I covered it in ink. Part of the fun of, of drawing these is just like getting to know, you know, getting to know the structure. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, until you commit to like really tackling it, you don't know it. So I'm, I'm not done with that. And that piece was one that I started a while ago. Um, I did a series of mandalas and, and one is in a show now with cicadas and it's the exoskeleton in the center and then coming to the different um, development of the cicada and in this one, this is another farm, another treasure that I found under a boathouse crawling around with one of my daughters and found all these lovelies. These are the exo exoskeletons, exoskeletons yeah. of dragonflies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what the heck kind of insect is that? And I collected as many as I could. <laughs> and so they're in the center and they're not quite dragonflies. These are other little this is this guy. Different model. My my true dragonfly is history. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it'll be that evolution. I had a vision of it being black and really just almost being the x-ray and having a softness, not a crisp illustrative, but like more of an echo ghost presence of that, um, the exoskeleton, and then the true form a little bit more crisp. And it's not quite a mandala and they do sort of twist in different views and no paper not square so just when you're like ah oh, shoot you can't square it off now so i started some of them square um but yeah a lot of times you think oh that's exactly what and then you're like oh i should have mm -hmm. should have nipped a couple of inches here and there but that's okay because life isn't isn't symmetrical that way I don't, I don't think so our experience and yeah i know that this is cutesy and pretty and i thought oh but I, I don't know, this is, it's, it's amazing. So I have my, my monarchs that I collected and I just wanted to, to draw them and you see the monarch from behind. And I thought the underside is where the magic is happening. Wow. And so I started working on, on, on this guy and just that crazy polka dotted body. I'm like, oh my goodness, did you ever see such a thing? So I, I literally just wanted to have fun, fun with those spaces. Okay, so I've got creatures that I've collected for 30 years, and it literally began with a cicada exoskeleton when I was 12 in Patrock, clinging to a tree, and I was like, what is that? And I saved it, and I probably still have it among my little cicada exoskeletons. Um, so I've, I've been collecting, and part of my big joy was looking at a National Geographic uh, electron microscope image of an insect with compound eyes and my head exploded and I was like this is magical and so yeah just looking and drawing and just the diversity is just so exciting and that guy um, below the butterflies reminds me of um, a trilobite which I had a trilobite went to Maine we visited a rock shop want a trilobite got a trilobite or trilobite Mm -hmm. So I have a godson, and we actually made the 12 days of Christmas with fossils and dinosaurs. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> oh, <you're laughs> yeah. So we have, we have all of these, and again, here it reminds me of the cicada. And I've got my ammonites. And these are for my niece. And I've got earrings. Ammonites. <laughs> and these found their way into that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. You never know what you need or mm -hmm. what, 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 what formally is taking you to the place you need to go. So yeah, I, I collect all sorts of things and just try different media just to like to think about what effect I'm trying to get. 
So with my exoskeleton, I, you know, do I draw on white? Do I erase? Um, and I've been collecting insects and people send them to me. Um, so I've got tarantulas that were mailed from Arizona live and the post woman didn't know that there was something in there. But then when I got it, it was like really sort of sweltery and, and stinky. So I put them in alcohol because my, um, my friend who is my tarantula expert said, no, the connective tissues will decompose. So he's an, he's an alcohol, he's been there for maybe 20 years and he stinks. The alcohol is super smelly. Um, yeah, lots of bones, uh, deer vertebra, cow pelvis, pig skulls, um, yeah. Oh, and, and my, my, my beauty over there is half horse, half cow. And that showed up on my door once. A friend was in town and he said, I knew you'd love it. And I did, it looked like a demon beast. So he's, he's, he's my sentry. So if you're coming to my, checking out my, my studio from outside, he's, he's looking at you. Yeah. So my graduation gift was uh, two pig skulls. And they were juicy, so that I put them outside thinking nature's gonna take its course. No, they got moldy, they were too fatty, so then I, I put them in bleach, which makes them really coarse, but at least clean, glued the teeth back in, and I brought them to school. So my students are drawing from them. And some students love them, other, other students are like, no, 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 no. But that's okay, but then you do find a student that goes crazy, so that's... Makes that connection. <laughs> yes, I'm ready for those so nice. students that, that wanna love it, yeah. So yeah, I've got, my table where I dry my prints, lot folders and folders. Um, yeah, got my sink. So I have two presses, which I love. Um, now they're etching presses. Now I do and have done a lot of contract printing. And it's kind of nice because it frees the workshop from their space being tied up, additioning. So that's kind of nice. And I love that I'm training my students to be good printers because artists are still making prints. And, <laughs> and there's, there's always room for some talented printers, printmakers. Collection. You also have an extensive collection of indoor plants as well. And it looks like from your hydrangea work that you work plants into your pieces. I do. I have a garden that um, we've had for like 30 years and my father-in-law was an avid gardener. So we, we tried to honor his seriousness and do a lot of planting. And with the paper making that we do in the studio and not on my own, um, I have plants that I harvest for uh, paper making um, in, in different ways. And I love it because sometimes we can incorporate fibers that are relevant to the imagery that's being made. Ooh, can you give us a tour and show us some of the plants that we get to see when we make the paper in the paper making classes? Would love to. Would love yeah, to. we've got um, northern sea oats and these, give, these turn like reddish and give these like beautiful little uh, kernels. Um, uh, switch grasses. This is called little blue stem. When you make the paper, they always end, they end up looking kind of similar, except they'll have a, like just a different tone. But that was my vision to, to plant these, and, and I'll always supplement it with another fiber. But these are all native grasses. And I just thought it was such a great idea. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my studio, oh, Lorena. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Lorena. Thank you, all of you. This has been such a fun afternoon. I hope I didn't talk too much. Oh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next paper making session. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, so exciting. Oh yeah. Would you like to go outside and take a peek at some fibers that okay. I harvest for mm -hmm. our paper making? We would love to do that. Love to yeah. do that. Okay.